major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. The campaigns are just about done and now it's all about turnout. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Voter participation is always a challenge, especially among young adults. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado visited UC San Diego to see if students there were engaged. San Diego County Registrar Cynthia Paz says her office has received more than 500,000 mail-in ballots for processing. She says she expects a turnout of 50 to 60 percent. Historically, young people have had the lowest turnout rate of any other voting age group in the nation. But lately, college students seem to be the exception. According to Tufts University, college turnout was 66 percent in the 2020 presidential election, up 14 percent from 2016. From what we see in our trends is we've actually seen a rise in student registrations or voter registrations from the campuses and then that kind of correlates with the election where you see more uh, folks go out to vote. So that's Alfredo Barcenas, the director of student governments at UC San Diego. He's seen a high demand for student voting resources and a jump in voting in the last elections. Is there going to be such a large number as to the general election? I don't know and maybe not so, but you are definitely going to see a bigger turnout this midterm. Almost every single student we approached voted, is planning on voting, or is voting now, like 20-year-old Alex Patterson. I would say it's pretty important. It's, you know, the only way we really have to make our voice heard. Then there are the few eligible voters, like 20... And it looks like we're experiencing some technical problems with that last story. The KPBS News has a lot planned for election night in San Diego. Our radio team will have a California election special starting at 9. We'll also have updates throughout the night on KPBS television and online. You can join us for a community conversation. And that's hosted by Amitha Sharma on YouTube, on Facebook, and on kpbs.org. Four years ago, a blue wave gave Democrats control of the House of Representatives. Now, Republicans are close to retaking the majority and even possibly more. Isabel Rosales looks at the national stakes on this election eve. Make no mistake, democracy is in the ballot for all of us. In this last sprint toward the midterm elections, candidates across the country are making their closing pitch and voters casting ballots in record numbers. What's happening in this country is not okay and uh, we are all suffering. Democrats battling to maintain control of the Senate, their majority razor thin. 35 of 100 Senate seats on the ballot. In the House, all 435 seats on the ballot. Speaker Nancy Pelosi facing an uphill battle to hold her majority. I see Democrats spending money in seats that Biden won by 20 points. New York. And what? why is it competitive? Cost of living, crime, the inflation. Statewide, 36 governor seats up for grabs. But all eyes on crucial battleground states. Get people to vote. Arizona, home to contested Senate and gubernatorial races. 12 of the 13 Republican nominees for federal and state office have questioned the results of the 2020 election, according to the Washington Post. Also critical, Nevada, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Are you happy? with where America's headed. One of the nation's most closely watched Senate races. Fundamental rights are on the ballot. And where three presidents stumped this weekend. President Biden's declining popularity, plus rising inflation and gas prices, are making it hard for Democrats to see a clear path ahead. From Capitol Hill, Isabel Rosales, KPBS News. 
And politicians from a generation ago might not recognize the current landscape in San Diego, once a reliably red county. Democrats have made huge gains. Claire Tregesser looks at the data and gets analysis on how it happened, and that's a bit later in the newscast. As Veterans Day approaches, city and county officials gather to discuss homelessness among vets. KPBS reporter Melissa May says they're looking for solutions. There's a gap between what's available and what folks know is available. Uh, and it's unique, I think, to our veteran community. Supervisor Nathan Fletcher was among other county and city leaders who met with former homeless veterans and local officials who lead housing, outreach, and service programs. Everyone served because they wanted to be a part of something greater than themselves. Being a part of something greater than themselves is not the only similarity amongst veterans. And then the reality is a lot of folks struggle when they get out. And, and maybe it's post-traumatic stress, maybe it's a little bit of that combined with just the difficulty of the transition. Mayor Todd Gloria discusses the current change in the homeless veteran population. This is one area where that number is going down, not up. Uh, and over the last two years, to be able to get a 27% reduction in the number of homeless veterans in San Diego is directly attributable to the fact that you have VASH vouchers from the VA. The Veterans Affairs Support Housing, or VASH program, includes rental assistance for homeless veterans. When we can prove that we can do that in the veteran population, we need to replicate that amongst our domestic violence victims, amongst our transitional foster care uh, youth, amongst other vulnerable parts of our community for where we need to make a similar commitment. Both Fletcher and Gloria look Look forward to meeting with the governor later this month to discuss the homeless situation in California. But point is, it's across the state, and what I see are a lot of other cities that are not, not dealing doing what our city is doing, other counties that are not doing nearly what the county of San Diego is doing. And so my hope is that the governor catches those folks and wakes them up to be a part of the solution. Melissa May, KPBS News. A quarter of a million dollars is now available for San Diego County teachers trying to pay for classroom projects. The money is coming from San Diego Gas and Electric shareholders. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez explains how it works. So it wants to hear your voice, so record something. Okay. There's a brilliant blend of all kinds of science going on here in Christina Hereford Watkins' eighth grade class. Some of it detached from reality. Getting in our virtual world. 13-year-old Xavier Castellano is strapped into his virtual reality headset as part of a lesson at Lemon Grove Academy Middle School, a campus in a neighborhood with many children who come from marginalized communities. I'm moving my arms according to the errors that it is showing me. Xavier and his classmates are using equipment similar to high technology used by scientists, engineers, and the military to solve problems and find new scientific discoveries. The headsets cost $5,000, and half of that was paid with funding from San Diego Gas and Electric shareholder matching grant. It's a program to provide equity in education. I think the students lose opportunities to try something that maybe would have sparked interest or something that maybe their peers are doing in other communities that they would not have had access to. Teachers post projects on the DonorsChoose.org website. Projects to supplement learning in science, technology, engineering, math, and racial equality curriculum. Then SDG&E shareholders will match donations raised. In some cases, tripling the matched money. When our teacher can add some extra pieces, I say the sprinkles, that helps keep our children engaged and keep them loving school. So this is extremely helpful. I want to be a meteorologist. And how might this help? Maybe like experiencing the weather through the metaverse. The Donors Choose Matching Program is open to teachers at any school in the SDG&E service area, and there is $250,000 to be spent. Applications will be taken until the money's gone. Since applications opened last Friday, Christina Watkins has already gotten more funding approved for six digital tablets to help students program her classroom robots. That's a reality check worth celebrating. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. 
Brushing your teeth, taking a shower, and grabbing a vape. More teens who use e-cigs are increasingly making it part of their daily routine. And that is according to new research from 2017 to 2021 that's published in JAMA Network Open. And it reports that 10% of adolescents report vaping within the first five minutes of waking up. Similar research had that number at around 1% during the previous four-year period. California banned flavored tobacco products back in 2020, but this year's Prop 31 asks voters to overturn that ban. Science from UC San Diego shows that spores can read environmental cues to return to life after thousands of years of dormancy. KPBS SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge tells us what that means for understanding life and perhaps the origin of life on Earth. Every Professor Garol Suell refers to an oval image on a screen. It's a dormant spore that in this video periodically changes color. It's counting every time that it encounters food and it's summing those signals and it gets brighter and it gets brighter and that means it's getting closer to closer to waking up. The spore is what's become of a bacterial cell that has encountered harsh conditions. It's not exactly dead, but Sewell says it's in a state of dormancy where the common needs and functions of a living organism are not seen. There's no metabolism, which is how food gets converted into chemical energy by the cell. There's no gene expression. A paper co-written by Sewell and published in the journal Science shows this undead organism is still able to monitor and respond to the presence of food, then rejoin the ranks of the living. And when they wake up, they go from white to black. Another microscopic video shows spores waking up after repeated signals that food is present. When they awake, they quickly assume the behaviors of life. So they take up water and they start doing all the normal biological processes that we would expect, like metabolism starts, gene expression starts, and they become a fully living, regular, so to speak, bacterial cell. Spores can survive for millions of years. This was shown by the discovery and revival of spores that once lived in the guts of an ancient honeybee and were preserved in amber. Surviving spores may be the best way to explain how extraterrestrial life could come to Earth. You know, one of the ideas uh, in terms of how life emerged on our planet is that maybe it hitchhiked on an asteroid or a comet and, and landed, crash landed on our planet. Uh, and so we're all sort of aliens from that perspective. We're all coming from somewhere else. Uh, but to do that, uh, you would have to have some kind of living material that survived this journey. And maybe, just maybe, that living material was a dormant spore. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. The annual climate change summit known this year as COP27 is underway in Egypt. Part of the agenda is whether poorer nations will end up being compensated for loss, loss or damage from extreme weather. Today's developments also include Saudi Arabia announcing a $2.5 billion investment in works to meet the net zero goals by the year 2050. Former U.S. Vice President Al Gore, now one of the leading voices on climate issues, is also at COP27, and he is calling out world leaders for acting too slowly. We have a credibility problem, all of us. We're talking, and we're starting to act, but we're not doing enough. It is a choice to continue this pattern of destructive behavior. We have other choices. And despite more engagement on climate change from the Biden administration, it has yet to emerge as a key election issue. A CNN poll this fall ranked it last among seven priorities for those questioned, with less than 40 percent describing it as extremely important to their vote. It's no secret that San Diego County voter registration has been trending away from the Republican Party in the last two decades. KPBS investigative reporter Claire Tregesser dives into the data to see what's driving the shifts. Take a look at a San Diego County voter registration map and you'll see a county that's become quite a bit more blue over the past two decades. And some voters who've left the Republican Party have no problem telling you why. 
For Bonita resident Nikki Petzl, it was Donald Trump's campaign for president in 2016. By the time it came time to vote in 2020, there was just absolutely no way I could vote for another Republican ever. While she grew up Republican and conservative, now she votes the entire Democratic ticket. The entire ticket. <laughs> I even if I didn't know what it was. Petzl is part of a political shift in San Diego's voter registration between 2004 and 2020. It's transformed San Diego from a county so reliably red to the light blue county it is today. The impacts of the sea change have been significant, says Thad Kauser, a politics professor at UC San Diego. We've seen this radical transformation just over the last two decades in San Diego from really a Republican stronghold to, to a, a battleground and now an area where if you look at the county board of supervisors, the city council, the legislative coalitions, Democrats have, have almost locked up every position. But the move away from the Republican Party has not happened evenly across the county. Areas like Escondido, Carlsbad, Lake San Marcos, and Valley Center all saw a drop in registered Republicans. But GOP registration actually increased in other places like El Cajon and Encinitas. California Republicans were always more moderate, with leaders like Congressman Brian Bilbray and Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who were socially liberal and pro-environment, but fiscally conservative. So the shift makes sense, Kauser says. And that's not Donald Trump, right? Uh, the culture wars, uh, getting rid of, of, of reproductive choice through, through Roe v. Wade and, 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 and pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, those sorts of steps took uh, the Republican Party sharply to the right and, and really too far to the right for many San Diego Republicans. Jordan Gascon is no fan of Trump, but the executive director of the San Diego County Republican Party wants local Republicans to fight for change within the party rather than leave. Staying Republican and moving the Republican Party in the direction that you want to see it, I think is very important. And um, people should stay in the Republican Party to do that, to affect change. Also, the data show voters fleeing today's GOP aren't necessarily flocking to the Democrats. Far more are becoming no party preference voters, which creates a new reality for campaigns. Ryan Klumpner, a San Diego-based campaign consultant, says the so-called independent voter used to be someone who checked out of politics. That's no longer the case. There affiliation as an independent is actually a reflection that they hold very specific opinions about politics rather than that they don't want to be bothered with politics. Klumpner says the region's demographics and growth patterns also play a significant role. For example, areas like Mira Mesa and Mission Valley have built more dense housing in the past decade, which draws in residents who are more likely to be lower income and younger, and those voters are less likely to be Republican. That changes the issues that they care about and how they live their lives, their access to public transit, um, the proximity to jobs. In a different environment, the same voters might be behaving a different way because they would care about different issues. But who knows how long this new behavior will last? As experts tell you, local politics can be like the weather. If you don't like it, just wait a while and it will change. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. A few years back, California voters chose to legalize marijuana for all adults. And now there's another measure on the ballot specific to San Diego County. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman tells us about Measure A. All San Diego County voters will see Measure A, the cannabis business tax, on their November ballots. The measure would allow the San Diego County Board of Supervisors to impose taxes on legal marijuana businesses in the unincorporated county. Everything from retail to distribution, testing, and cultivation is on the table. The taxes could bring in between 3 to $5 million per year, and that money could be used for any government purpose, ranging from parks to public safety or or even road repairs. The measure was placed on the ballot by a majority vote of the Board of Supervisors. Supporters say it's a bipartisan solution to advance the legal cannabis market and help curtail illegal operations. Opponents argue Measure A is unfair because it only applies to businesses in the unincorporated county, yet all county voters are taking it up. 
They also question whether revenues would actually go towards services in the areas that are paying the cannabis tax. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. And that explainer is just one example of the content that you'll find at the KPBS Voter Hub. We have versions in English and in Spanish this year. If you're planning to work on your ballot tonight or tomorrow, it's a good resource to find voting locations in your neighborhood. We also have all of the stories our reporters have worked on this election cycle. And you can get to the KPBS Voter Hub by clicking the link on our homepage, kpbs.org. Quite the impactful storm on the move here right through Tuesday into Tuesday night and Wednesday. This will bring about some heavy rain. In fact, the heaviest we have seen in months. Localized flooding in low-lying and poor drainage areas. And over the higher terrain, we will see some mountain snow and, of course, quite a bit of wind. We'll also notice that wind to the north, right wood, uh, say out toward a big bear and we're going to be following the snow there, too, as we go through time. And notice no wind advisories out right now that could change as we go down the road, especially as we venture our way into Tuesday night. Some of the mountainous terrain could see those southwesterly winds upwards of 30, 35, gusting over 40 miles per hour. Keep the umbrellas handy. We're going to be looking at that wet weather here for tonight. Ocean City, San Diego, Chula Vista with low temperatures falling down into the 60s. And we'll continue to see the storminess as we go through Tuesday. This will be our heaviest rain making its way through during the day. Snow level still way up there. The very, very highest of terrain as we go through the day. They'll begin to lower Tuesday night to Wednesday. And by the time we get to Wednesday, the majority of the heavier precipitation will be moving out. But we could see upwards of an inch of rain around San Diego. Some higher amounts out to the east into the foothills. Mount Laguna, you're going to be talking about the rain before that switch over to snow. And some spots here could see over two inches of rain away from the coast and uh, to the east of some of those inland western valleys. Let's take a few future casts and you'll start to see as we work our way through Tuesday how that moisture begins to fill its way in and press its way through the area. Rain can be heavy at times. Temperatures climbing into the upper 60s towards San Diego. Borrego Springs 74. Still warm in Mount Laguna, but that will change as we go into Wednesday and we see that transition of rain over to snow for the mountains. Here's a look at the coast. We'll see that wet weather Tuesday. Still some lingering showers Wednesday and then it's cool, but it dries out later on this week as we talk about inland locations. Big time temperature climb later on this week, but the wet weather here here Tuesday into Tuesday night. There's the snow on Wednesday. You can see a couple of inches toward Mount Laguna, and then you dry out into the weekend over the deserts. Also looking to be on the stormy side Tuesday, and then we'll start to warm things up for the weekend. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Justin Povick. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News, our candidates make their closing arguments to voters before Election Day. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. While the cost of travel is up, enrolling in TSA PreCheck will cost you less. The price for enrollment and in-person renewals is dropping by $7 from $85 to $78. Online renewals will cost the same $70, but once approved, a TSA PreCheck is good for five years and allows passengers to move faster through security while leaving on their shoes, their jackets, and their belts. Last September, 93% of PreCheck passengers waited less than five minutes at checkpoints. It is the largest lotto prize ever. People are rushing to grab Powerball tickets for tonight's drawing, which is estimated at $1.9 billion. But with recent interest rate hikes, what would the payout actually be? Reporter Ivan Rodriguez breaks down the numbers. What would you do if you won almost $2 billion? What would I do? Well, I definitely would quit my job and travel. Charities and definitely take care of my family. I don't even know. That's just a life-changing amount of money. That could be the reality for someone or some ones by 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. With no top prize winners for the last 40 drawings, Monday night's Powerball has the biggest jackpot in lottery history and expected $1.9 billion. The odds of winning matching all five numbers and the Powerball are almost 1 in 300 million. But before you start making your list of exactly how you would spend it, there are a few things to consider. 
The jackpot amount is what you would take home before taxes if you choose to get 30 equal payments of $63 million over the next 29 years. If you decide to take the cash option in one lump sum, you'd get about $929 million. However, the IRS takes 24% right off the top, plus it's possible the state you win in gets a cut. Annuity payments are always bigger than the cash value because the lottery sponsor invests your winnings over time which mature and earn interest annually. And the recent federal interest rates are actually causing that value to increase. But whatever you choose to do tomorrow after you win the jackpot, it's enough for you and your favorite co-workers to retire on. Help me do the payout. Payout so I can help my family and help people in need and, and volunteer. Ivan Rodriguez, KPBS News. And one ticket sold in Encinitas came close this weekend. Lotto officials confirmed that it was bought at the Rite Aid on Manchester Avenue. Only the Powerball number was off. And that ticket is good for a prize of more than $1.1 million. Congratulations. <laughs> and here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. NPR's Morning Edition will have a conversation on media literacy in America and how disinformation is being addressed during the general election. And then on KPBS Midday Edition, we'll a special report on climate change and how it's affecting California's wildfires. And please be sure to join us tomorrow night for election coverage on K all KPBS platforms. KPBS Radio will have a California election special that starts at 9 with local reaction from our team of reporters. And we'll also have updates throughout the night on KPBS television. And online there will be a community conversation on our YouTube and our Facebook pages and of course at kpbs.org. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following... by viewers like you. Thank you.